Hey, Vlad here, DevInsideU.com. Welcome to another video. In this video, we will cover the basics of the set theory, just enough to finally start working on our collections library. And the first collection being, well, sets. We're going to go really slowly with this one, and I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up with around 10 videos about sets. And hopefully these videos are going to be shorter than my usual videos, which are, you know, around an hour. And remember that I'm using collections just as a vehicle to get as fast as possible to generics or parametric polymorphism or higher kind of types, which is sort of like the same thing, and implicits. So let's not waste any more time and get started. All right, so sets are a very intuitive construct, uh, which is good because in a sense, there's nothing magical about them. A set is just a collection of distinct objects. Uh, that's pretty much it. But still, um, it, is, it is very valuable to look at them the way mathemat mathematicians or programmers or computer scientists do. Okay, so this is probably the most important bit in this entire video. Every time you hear a word set in the con context of programming, uh, you should remember only two things. Um, these two. These are basically laws. Every time you hear the word sets, you basically need to know, okay, there are no duplicates because, you know, distinct objects and there is no order. Now, no duplicates means that if you have an empty set, for example, and you add the word hello in there three times, then the length or the size of the set is still going to be one, right? Because it's the same object. Basically, the, the set is going to just throw the other, the other ones out, right? So in the end, it's going to be only one distinct object. And remember the video that I made about uh, equality, I'm going to link it over here, uh, be, be equality being hard in the world of programming. And we, we need it over here, right, to, to be able to, to distinguish objects from, from, an, uh, from, from each other, right? So if, they, if you remember uh, correctly, if the, if the equals method is not uh, implemented correctly, then uh, you're going to run into issues. Number two, there is no order, which means that if you take a set with two words in there, hello and the world, it will be equal to another set, world and hello. And maybe it's clear already but you can also nest sets right so a set can have every element as another set right so if you put if you take a set an empty set and you put a set with hello and world in there and then after that you put another set with world and hello in there the size is still going to be one right because the order doesn't matter so the elements are still the same to it by the way sets having no order is technically not a law but uh, this is how things work work in the world of math, right? So if the definition, which is right here, a set is a collection of distinct objects, if the definition doesn't mention order, then you shouldn't assume it. See, the thing is that in programming, uh, many times you might be confused that, you know, you print out a set and just by some miracle or accident, uh, the, 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 you, you, will, you will think that it's ordered because, you know, occasionally, you know, you, you create a set and you put a one and two and three and four in there and then you print it out and then you will see a set of one and two and three and four. This is just a coincidence, just an accident, so never rely on order of sets. Before continuing explaining what sets are, uh, let's talk about what sets are good for. Uh, sets are good for, uh, especially when you're when you're talking about databases, and because we're surrounded with, with data these days, uh, understanding the basics of the set theory is very important. I mean, think about it, we're surrounded with sets. You have you know a set of pencils, set of friends, set of subscribers, set of likes. Thinking in terms of sets is very useful. For instance, one of the common things that you can do with a set is to compute its intersection with another set, right? And the result of that operation is going to be a different set. Do you know how in the movie some cop says, okay, cross-reference his picture with the FBI database and then with the CIA database. And the result of that is going to be intersection, right? So this is basically intersection of sets. Another example of intersection would be what uh, websites like Facebook or LinkedIn, for example, or other social media do when they suggest friends to you, right? So the first thing they do is they, they, they take a random friend, right? And uh, they calculate the intersection of the friends list, right? Of your friend and of you. And maybe three people come out, right? Those three people are on both your friends list. And then they keep recursively going like this, right? So they look at your friends' friends list. And then they find out, you know, they, they calculate the intersection of their friends and with, with somebody on your friend friends list, right? So when then then when something comes up, they suggest this to you because it's on the friends list of your friends. By the way, they use a special type of databases to perform um, queries like this very efficiently, and they go by the name of graph databases. And another, by the way, is that a friends list is technically the wrong word. The correct word would be a friends set. Maybe a friends list has an order, but it for sure doesn't have duplicates. 
All right, so all the information presented so far is agnostic of programming languages. A set is a sets are a very mathematical construct. And if you're using a library that violates either of these two laws, I would highly suggest stop to stop using this library. I'm usually open minded in, in my videos, but this is pretty much where I draw the line. What can differ is the following. Uh, if you are in a dynamic language, it might allow you to put different kinds of elements into the same set. It doesn't have to, but typically dynamic dynamic languages allow you to do something like this like for example over here uh, this is a uh, JavaScript I believe yeah this this JavaScript um, and um we're creating a set of integers, obviously, right? So there's one, two, three, and then all of a sudden we're adding another um, a, a, another element, but this element is not an integer, right? It's a string. And then you're asking the string if it uh, you're asking the set if it if it contains this element, and sure, it contains both of them. Whereas in, in a language like Scala, which is statically typed, um, the the collections are homogeneous, right? So different types are called heterogeneous, and the same type is called hom homogeneous, right? So um, this is a um, mutable set, which means uh, every time you add an element, the same as over here, you're actually changing the collection in place, right? So even though it's a val over here, you're still changing its internal state, right? But uh, in this case, the compiler is just gonna, you know, reject uh, what you're doing here, right? So it's gonna say, hey, you know, uh, I'm expecting an integer, but you're giving me a string. Most of the content in this channel is related to Scala in one way or the other, and so is this video. And uh, over here, this is where generics or parametric polymorphism will come in. We will be able to have a set of events or a set of strings and have the compiler help us out. And we're going to have very interesting discussions um, about this. For example, um, uh, when, when it comes to, to subtype uh, polymorphism, how, how does it mix with parametric polymorphism, right? For example, if you have a, a bank account and then you have a um, PayPal account, which extends bank account. And now if you have a set, set of um, and bank accounts, should you be allowed to add a PayPal account in there? It sounds sort of intuitive, but it's actually way more complicated than you think. All right, we're getting ahead of ourselves anyway. Uh, since math is a language and uh, sets are a mathematical construct, uh, we might as well start with a mathematical example. And this whole math part is going to take only a few minutes. So have no fear, Vlad is here. What you see here is a very common mathematical function which uh, squares any number that gets put in. And every function has a so-called domain, which is basically a set of all the possible inputs, right? So it's this x over here, right? And a so-called codomain, which is a set of all the possible results. Now for a function like square, a typical domain, right? So the typical set of all the inputs are the integers, right? So you can put negative numbers and you can also put positive numbers. Uh, and the codomain is just the natural numbers, right? So there are no negative results uh, in a square function. For instance, if you take a negative 3, which is a part of the domain, right, because it's integers, uh, then the result is going to be 9. And if you take a positive, uh, positive 3, then the result is still going to be 9. And, you know, both of these 9s, I mean, it's the same 9, right? They are the element of the natural numbers. Now, the way you write this down, as I already mentioned, you know, math of the language, so it has a notation. Uh, you just basically say, okay, every x has to be an element of, and this symbol stands for integers. I don't know why. It's probably from Greek or Latin. I don't know. And and uh, this is what, what's going to happen for subdomain, right? So every, uh, for the codomain, I'm sorry. So um, every result of the function is going to be an element of the natural numbers, right? So zero or, or, or higher, greater. It's all very basic stuff. It's not really rocket science. And um, as you might already notice, uh, sets might have a property um, of being subsets of, 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 of another set, right? So for example, every natural number is included in every integer, right? So sets can be subsets of each other. And by the way, this is how you would write it in Scala. And a Scala doesn't have a type which can express only natural numbers. You could create your own, obviously, but you know, by default, it doesn't have anything, right? So um, therefore, it's okay that the result is a superset of the regular codomain, right? So um, yeah, as I said, you know, every natural number is included in integers. Um, it's all very basic stuff. I, I, I somehow, you know, sometimes feel, you know, even a bit arrogant explaining this. Like I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Um, anyway, now, if you remember high school, your math teacher might say something like this. Okay, so uh, the typical uh, domain for the square function are integers, but today we're only going to talk about uh, the positive inputs, right? So the positive numbers. Um, so the graph is going to look like this, and the notation is going to look like that, right? And this is possible for two reasons. Uh, the first one is, as we have seen, natural numbers are a subset of integers. And the second reason is that this is pretty much what mathematicians do all the time, right? They just walk around and define stuff. 
Yet another example would be to say, okay, it's all the, the domain is all the positive numbers, uh, but without the zero, right? So this symbol is, stands for the difference between between the two sets, and um, we're actually going to talk about this in a, in a few minutes. And the graph is going to look like this. You know, it's going to start with a one, right? So as you can see, uh, one one of the powers of uh, this particular notation is that uh, it can actually express infinite sets, a topic which we're not going to discuss anymore over here. Another thing that you can do is you can basically just in plain English specify uh, which properties the elements of the set have to be uh, have to have in order to be part of the set, right? So you can just say, okay, this is a set of uh, every x which is even, right? So um, you know the zero, the two, the four, and so on, right? And for small sets, yet another um, notation exists, which is more relevant for programming because you know very often we just construct like very very small sets explicitly by just basically uh, specifying which elements are part of the set. So uh, this is basically. Um, just a you know a bunch. Uh, I'm gonna say bunch because I'm gonna try to avoid saying the word list. It's basically a bunch of elements uh, split by commas and surrounded with curly braces. And an empty set would be, for example, like this. You know, just just empty braces, right? And in in a language like Scala, we will have something like this. So we're gonna have an object set, and it's gonna have a def, for example, empty, right? And it will give you an empty set. Or we're gonna uh, call a the apply function on the set object. Uh, which is going to have uh, the variable amount of arguments. We haven't talked about um, functions like this uh, so far in this playlist, but you know we, we will very soon, right? And then you can pass as many as many elements as as you want over here, right? And also you could just you know have an empty set and then say okay let's add one element and let's add you know another element you know which is two and let's add another element which is three. Uh, in this entire playlist we're going to be talking about only immutable sets, which means every time you add an element you're actually not adding an element. You're constructing an entirely new set, right? So after after this operation, for example, you know, after dot add one, the empty set still exists and the new set which contains only this one element. Also still exists, right? And after that, you know, you, you add two. Now three, three distinct sets exist, right? The first one contains, you know, one and two. The other one contains only the one, and the third one is empty. So you can assign them to different vowels and keep using all of them. And as you can see, the benefits of this notation is conciseness and the fact that you can express infinite sets. And the benefits of that is well, basically, it's very very simple. The last rather formal mathematical thing that we're going to talk about is ways of combining sets, uh, right? So how how do you compose sets with each with each other? And there are quite a few uh, so-called combinators defined on sets, and we're going to talk about about them right now. There's just a few of them, and they have a very very strong relation to formal logic. If you remember, you know things like a or b or a and b or not a not b things like this, right? So um, we're going to start with union, and we're going to use so-called uh, Euler uh, diagrams. I hope I'm pronouncing it right because you know I'm in Germany, so I, I learned this like the German way. And in Germany, you know, we would say Euler the same way we say Euro and not you know Euro. So I'm guessing it's it's pronounced Euler diagrams. Uh, so you basically you, you you draw circles, and you know the elements are going to be inside of the circle. As I said, it's very very intuitive. So what Union is doing is it's 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 a binary operation, right? Which means you know it has it you know you have to give it two sets, right? So the first one is one and two, which is the red circle over here, and the second one is one, three, four, which is the blue circle over here. So what union is doing is it basically just takes all of them together, and remember there are no duplicates, right? So this is why we've seen one only once, right? So uh, usually when you're looking at Euler diagrams, you would have stripes that are marking what the operation is doing, but I couldn't figure out a way how to do this, you know, on a computer. Uh, so basically, um, I'm just going to show you what you know which elements are inside. So uh, in after this operation completes, you go, you know, the set is going to produce which contains all of these elements, right? Two, one, three, and four. And this is how you would do it in Scala. You know, we create a set of A. You're going to call it A. You're going to this one is going to be called B. Uh, we're going to have a function called union or, or a method called union. We're going to say A union B, and the result is going to be a completely different set. Remember, everything is immutable. We're not actually changing the set A, and what's being produced is a set of one, two, three, four, which is which is basically everything. Uh, quite a few things to notice here. So not on this example, right? But if you had two sets A and B, and if you compute the union of A and B, and then it turns out that the union is B, then the picture would look in such a way that the whole circle for A is going to be inside the circle of B, and this is what a subset is, right? And the notation for this would look like this. It basically looks like a less than or equal sign, right? But just everything is rounded. And the same way for for this one, by the way, right? This symbol, it basically looks like a like a logical or. And by the way, I forgot to explain this, right? So basically, a union of a and a, a 
or be right uh, it basically means that you know this is going to be a set where every element is an element of a or every element is an element of b right so basically it's, it's all the elements right so this is why you know this thing looks like an or the next operation is intersection which is basically diametrically opposed to it right and it resembles the and symbol right so it's called the intersection it basically means okay give me all the, the elements that are both in a and in b right in this case it's only the one so usually you would have you know stripes like this right it's very intuitive right so we're going to call it intersection or intersect and it's going to work exactly you know exactly the same way in terms of in terms of syntax right but the semantics are obviously diametrically opposed the last major combinator is the difference and we have seen it uh before remember when we were, or we were saying okay uh every x has to be a positive uh number but zero so you can either use the you know the dash or the hyphen or the minus um symbol or sometimes a backslash is used right so the difference uh by the way is not uh, a commutative operation so it, it very much matters uh what you're subtracting from what it's the same as you would do with regular algebra right it, it, it matters you know if you do five minus three or three minus five the result is going to be different it's the same over here basically it says okay give me every element that is in a but it is not in b so it's going to be in this case just the two so the stripes would go like this from here you know so it's only only the red part which is not the blue part so it's going to look like this right so it's a and not b and the other way around if you subtract a from b then you're gonna leave uh you know you're gonna be left with this blue circle uh that is not you know that doesn't contain this red part so it's going to contain you know the three and the four so it's basically uh everything that is in b and or you know you can say also but uh it is not an a all right, so there are many interesting things that can be done with sets uh but for now this is enough so to recap no duplicates no order the union is basically an or the intersection is basically an end and the difference is basically a not i found a cool page online which is basically sort of like a cheat sheet for sets i'm gonna leave the link down in the description and i found another one which contains all the uh symbols right so all the notation uh for for some uh, some other operations and basically for everything that that surrounds uh sets which is uh quite a bit more than what i've shown here remember uh, all i've shown here is uh just enough for us to get started to to actually implement um uh, sets in scala all right that's basically it i didn't want to make this video too long it's been vlad devinsidey.com like this video if you did subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you and most importantly take care